Tonight, what I wanted to show you was exactly that, a series of works that um, they have defined the way I work. And it's not exactly a definition, it's a, actually a way of breaking the way that I work and breaking the way I think people uh, receive some things about my work. So I will start really, really far uh, from here. This actually is a, a work that I made when I was still in the art school. This is the Zócalo, the main plaza, main square in Mexico City. Um, this is the subway ventilation. And what I did is just to put some threads and to put some uh, plastic gloves so they can move through the air of the um, ventilation. Um, I get really lucky because while I was doing this, there was this um, um, reporter that took a photo and put it on the newspaper. And from there, I started to realize the, actually the power of the um, public space. Of course, this was about demonstrations. And when I look back, I love this kind of, uh, of works. I see that many things haven't changed that much that we still have the same kind of news, like pro pro protesters of, uh, or demonstrations of teachers you can read in the top, or problems with university, or students taking the university uh, installations. And this was in 1994. So my work has always had this relation with games. Um, at the beginning, there were, well, there had, there had been around games and about actions, um, significant actions or intense intentions. So from here, uh, people thought that I was actually selling this uh, in the street. <laughs> and uh, I, I left some people to, to, to take them back home. And yeah, it was a playful way of working with the space. From there, I uh, started working a lot with sound. I uh, wanted to be a musician and I had a rock band. Actually, I was, uh, I was um, registered in the um, revenue agency of Mexico as a musician, not as a visual artist. And I stayed like that till today in Mexico, so when I get paid, I get paid as a musician. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the, the rock thing didn't work really well, so I, I stopped, but I still uh, uh, yeah. pursue a career in the visual arts, and I studied in the uh, National Academy of Fine Arts in Mexico City, that it was really near to this uh, main plaza in, in Zócalo. It's maybe the oldest uh, art school in the continent. And I mean, they have had students like Diego Rivera, and, you know, like all the big um, artists from the last two or three centuries. So, um, trying to make a kind of mixture between this uh, sound and music approach and creativity to the field of visual arts, I started making a series of works that they were called audiographias, like audiographic, or it was a way of uh, drawing with the tape of a cassette. So if you see here, uh, what I do is just to adapt the cassette player, and I took out the tape, and then it will go through these rollers, make some kind of drawing, and then come back. And actually, um, this kind of work uh, started to have uh, like a really fast relevance. I was uh, really lucky. I was in the last year of the school, and I won the national prize for young artists in Mexico with this series of works. So I will show you a couple of of them. Actually, the um, this one, this suitcase is the. It was the winner. I don't have the documentation of this one. But it was about, about the earthquake that we have in 85 in Mexico City. And what I did is to make a kind of um, drawing of the line 
in this paper of the earthquake registration. So from that series of, of works I was dipping into more and more uh, ways of working with this concept of the, the line, the active line. Actually, this was um, a contest, an installation contest in 96, I remember, in Mexico City. And I got the second prize for this installation. And what I made is this kind of rain of tapes that they were making each uh, different comment. There was a book in this stand, in each stand. And there was some interaction of the, um, of the tape. For example, here is a kind of jigsaw going really near to these um, chess pieces and stuff like that. It was all different kinds of um, social media related stuff and news stuff. And it was a cacophony of, of sounds. There were like too many sounds at the same time. But let's say that after a while, I don't know, like you, you start to not only to, to get a little bit tired of, of, of the work that y you notice that something is like not going in, in the right direction but you're actually starting to have too many commissions in the same line like telling you you have to do this that it looks it or it resembles to the the piece that you made and uh, that, that got this price and stuff like that and I don't know I, I have always have like really big um, authority issues <laughs> since I was a kid. <laughs> so that, that helped me as well to, to jump from one side to the other. Um, I, I made a transition. I mean, there's, there's always works that they take you to another place. Mm -hmm. But I, I uh, decided to put it like in storage. Mm -hmm. So I kept myself like doing a lot of new work. And people forgot completely about all this series. I mean, just very recently, uh, people somehow, uh, they remembered that I, w uh, that I started as a sound artist. Mm -hmm. And they have been showing now this work back. And now I'm happy because I somehow managed to jump. I made this um, circle of uh, connections with these speakers. Each speaker goes to a plate of copper that is here. And there's a, a motor with um, an arm that makes connection to each of these. So the sound goes from one to the other while this is connecting the, the different plates. So it's a kind of really uh, primitive uh, sensor round system. Because as I told you, I, I have a, an engineer father, but mm -hmm. since I didn't want to pursue that way, I was always sneaking on the way he was uh, fixing things, mm -hmm. but I made it all differently or wrong or in a very primitive uh, fashion that I really like. Even the, the show that I have here could, could be seen a little bit like, complex, but at the end it's like really simple things and really simple ways of, of solution of this kind of thing. So it sounded like this. Let me see. Yeah, the sound is not the best, but... So, of course, when you were inside, I mean, is this guy chanting, no? Uh, mm -hmm. You felt like he was, like, around you, like, going around and around. And, of course, the, the loop idea for me it was really important. Of course, uh, I started making the loop like really physically, as you have seen, the loop of the tape. It was a real, a real loop, uh, an endless tape. So with this uh, fight um, installation is what Jimena just uh, said. And, and I made uh, more or less the same. What I did is to put a, a Nawa uh, fighter with an Inuit fighter in a kind of fight because there are chanting and at the same time the structure is uh, you will see a, a speaker in one side and a knife in the other one sorry that the sound is not that good but maybe we'll listen some
And you can barely pass through the knife if you want it, of course. <laughs> there was some space. So yeah, um, from there, I, as I told you, I, I started to feel that um, somehow I already made the, the points that I needed. There were some uh, ideas that I pursued later on, but they uh, became sketches and then I, I made it back. I will show you maybe one uh, later on. But um, let's say that sometimes you have uh, yeah, to try different things. So this series of works um, I have been made in, I started in 97, 98 more or less, and I, I still make them. Um, what I do is to buy really old postcards when I don't have too much to do, uh, at flea markets or antique stores, and I take out the original stamp and I put a new stamp. I make uh, a good um, scanning of the work, and then I send it back to the original uh, destination. So it's called Boomerang, and it's a way of, you know, like getting back something that it was uh, originally planned to go somewhere and then finishes in the trash. So I buy it and I recycle it. Um, <laughs> Actually, I, I never follow what happened with the, with the result, but I'm pretty sure that it will be kind of scary if you get a postcard from almost 100 years old or more <laughs> at your place, or, or even the post officer will be getting kind of crazy what to do with these kind of things. Actually, the, the, the addresses, they work, so I'm pretty sure that they make their best effort to, to get them. And the beautiful part of the postcard is that you don't have a, an address to have it back. And uh, as you will see later, I, I, I like this uh, way of breaking uh, the way you see things or you feel. Sometimes it's, it's kind of an emotional terrorism, I think, mm -hmm. because uh, it can be poetic, but it can be like really scary. I mean, there's people that they can get really scary, but it's a, it's a way of letting go as well, you know? It's a really cheap, easy piece to do. <coughs> and I know that it's not pointless, but it looks like a little bit. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know a response. I don't have a response, and I don't wait for the response. But I, I like the act of sending this back where it was uh, supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So yeah, let's say that is this maybe is not inside a series of works. It's like these bumps that you find. But I really think that you have to follow them as well. And on time, they become something else. Because at the beginning, I was sending things that they were made, I don't know, in the 80s or the 90s of the last century. But so far now, I have sent stuff that is more than 110 years old. And then, because I got some friends that they're antique uh, masters and stuff like that. So really, really, you know, like, uh, historical stuff. I have seen like really historical stuff from the revolution, from Mexico, uh, things like that. I mean, of course, when you're working in, in a series, then you find like really things that they are connected. But sometimes you have this kind of works as well that only on time if you follow them, you notice that they have some relation with the other. And that helped get me into a lot of trouble. I mean, so I, I don't consider myself a very verbal person even though I, I try my best. Um, and with that, I, I have to tell you that I am, I'm completely sure that I think in images. I'm, I'm pretty sure that some of us are in the same way. Uh, I always like to talk, uh, well, to say a, a nice anecdote. When I was really, really small, I was really uh, good drawing. Uh, but my letter was really bad. I was really bad uh, when I was, uh, the yeah, the handwriting was really, really bad. And even some teachers, uh, they asked me to read the exams and the, mm -hmm. uh, the answers. And they told me, I know that you're a good student and I will give you the chance to mm -hmm. read this. 
and I will take some points out because mm -hmm. it's a really a messy thing. But if there's, if it's okay, then you will pass. Mm -hmm. So I read them, and I and they, they told me, yes, yes, you're smart, mm -hmm. but you you don't know how to <laughs> write. Mm -hmm. So if you do this again, you will not pass the next the next time. So um, on time, uh, talking with artists. Uh, we come to this uh, idea that writing and uh, drawing are two faces of the same coin. Uh, the gesture is the same. There are lines, there are points. But one wants to define the world, and the other wants to represent or to recreate or to, to make new, wor new worlds. It's new worlds, sorry. So I have always think that uh, when I'm trying to explain my work, when I'm doing it, People never understand my point, so I get into trouble. I say, I want to do this, and they think, uh, I don't think it's a good idea, but try it. And then when I do it, they, they start to understand where, where they go. Uh, for example, this is a Russian really old uh, postcard as well. And I think it's beautiful. As I told you, I, I made this uh, um, scanning, so I make enlargement almost the, the same size that you're looking right now. So you can see all the details of the fungus uh, on the paper and the way that it was written and all the beautiful details. And it becomes a more landscape piece. And it's always like only one edition. There was one postcard that I sent somewhere and there was just one uh, reproduction of the work that I think it makes some, some kind of poetic sense. So uh, the previous work that I showed you, the mechanical, the sound related, then um, become a series of ways of uh, working with people or making uh, people to do the action that I was thinking of instead of making uh, this uh, mechanical um, representation or a mechanical approach. This piece is called On the Air, and I was uh, already working with um, um, the sound, but with the radio pirate uh, transmissions. So I was invited to the biennial, and I decided to make this uh, series of instructions. So you will arrive to two or three places, you will be asked to leave an ID, and people will give you a model airplane, a styrofoam model airplane, and um, a radio headphone. So you could tune to 90.1, I remember that was my uh, pirate radio station, and you can listen to the uh, sounds that I was transmitting. And actually what I was transmitting, there was a series of uh, recordings of uh, black boxes of different air disasters. This was prior 9-11, uh, so the way it was seen and received was completely different. It was a really playful-like approach because there was nothing that relates you to that kind of things. Of course, there was the disaster. As I told you, sometimes I try to go to points that there are some kind of distance, like the game and the disaster in this. But th let's say that this is uh, the beginning of the more, what is it called now, relational, but at that time it was not uh, said like that. So I will show you a little bit of the work.
people that they didn't want to play at all or to listen to the thing and I, I understand that I really respect that <laughs> uh, but there were others for example the kids I, I have lots of, of when I always present the, the, the project I, I always have like these big discussions of how we're gonna handle it. as I told you I'm, I'm not really verbal but even though I mean people think for example in the kids you know, they told me no this is gonna traumatize the kids you shouldn't do this because and I said, no, actually, I'm pretty sure that they will have fun, and it's not something. There's not something graphical. Mm -hmm. And at the end, at the end, when we try it, uh, they were really happy. They were making lots of jokes, and actually, they were trying to match the exact moment of the crash with the crash of the model airplane and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And actually, what the, the adults were the ones that they were not uh, eager to mm -hmm. to play. But this is um, a piece that I made in the border of Mexico and the States. And uh, it's really funny because it was made between 2000 and 2001. <coughs> Some of these projects take a long time to be done. And it was about the problems that we have between these two countries, Mexico and the States. So I decided to take uh, an anthropological and sociological approach of how to solve uh, problems between two communities. And one simple way of seeing it is to try to either integrate them or separate them completely. So I took that uh, both views to a um, uh, playground situation. So the first is a separation game. And my idea, it was to make uh, the border that divides Mexico and the States two times higher than it is. But it was not as, as bad as you will see and it, it was not <coughs> as, as crazy as uh, uh, the people that now want, uh, rules the states want to. This is the world that is still in Tijuana, Mexico. Uh, and I was starting there my construction, of this fascist uh, idea. Well, it looks like a fascist idea, but you will see that the result, it was to construct this uh, handball court. This is the simplest uh, game that you can have with a wall. So, uh, well, the kids have a lot of fun, and, and the adults as well. They they put a basketball uh, thing as well that it was broken. They really took the, the the court as part of the community. But of course, you always have the problem of what happens when the ball goes to the other side. So I, I, I went back and I was really, I took, I took this uh, footage. And this is what happens. And this happens all the time, not only in my piece, but when they are playing soccer or, or whatever they're working. <laughs> so they jump and you might think, no, this is terrible. They're gonna get killed or whatever, but Actually, nothing happens. I mean, they just go to the other side. They take the ball, like, mm -hmm. in an other house of your neighbor <laughs> and take it back. And when they see the border patrol, they make fun of them and they ask mm -hmm. them for the ball and they 
Bolita, por favor, please pass me the ball. Please pass me the ball. <laughs> and the Border Patrol is never happy, but they don't do anything because actually it's just, all the thing is just a mock up. I mean, the world is, is really something. That so that's still there? Still. Uh, it was there till two or three years ago. Yeah. It, long, uh, uh, it lasted a long, a long time, but it's not there anymore. Yeah. And it's on the, on the Mexican side in Colonia Libertad, Tijuana. So that was the separation game. Like, we don't have. It was 2000, between 2000 and 2001. Yeah. But it took us almost like, yeah, a year and a half or two years to make like the whole preparation and uh, to get the um, permissions and stuff. Not only of this, because of the construction and, you know, the loss of the two countries, because it has to go to both sides, not only the Mexican side, so you have but to both. Ask for permission of both sides. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and for the other one, I think it was more more complex because, of course, when you want to separate, it's really easy to just put the things in one side and then forget about everything. But the second uh, the second approach it was the integration game, mm -hmm. and there instead of uh, having um, Mexicans against uh, Americans. I came with this idea of two games. One is basketball, and the other one was soccer. Uh, it's mm -hmm. more Latino and the other one more, more American. So for teams, I invited two uh, high school teams from the States uh, that play basketball, uh, to play a normal basketball be play between them. And at the same time, I invited two Mexican high school soccer teams mm -hmm. to play a normal soccer game. <coughs> Actually, it was an indoor soccer game between them, but with the variation of happening in the same place at the same time. Mm -hmm. So then you have the problem of sharing the space, right? Mm -hmm. Double the trouble and double the fun, maybe. El recreo. Son nuestros recreos. Sí. Solo nosotros entendemos eso. <laughs> Sorry? I will put this down uh, because it's very. <sighs> Sorry, what? Uh, the players, you mean? Uh, actually, I, I worked with them, but separately. This was the first time that they went all together. Uh, so I explained them the whole concept and the whole idea of the whole uh, process. Um, and they made some kind of, not rehearsals, but they were uh, making their practices, trying to see how to handle. I was telling them that Somehow basketball can be a little more aerial and soccer could be more near the ground and stuff like that. Uh, but actually, I mean, many of my works, they do have this structure, as you have seen. Uh, but especially this one, I, I started to let go. I, that's what I wanted to show you, the boomerang one, that is uh, completely letting go of the thing. But this, it has like a really big uh, structure, but. At the end, everybody was asking me, so what will happen? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> That's where we're going to find out. So we have to ask permission for the parents and, you know, <laughs> have an ambulance and, and all the waivers and security because things could go really wrong. I mean, they could get into a fight or whatever or get an injured. That it would be like, an, you know, like a normal whoo basketball or soccer injured but anyway they, they were really eager to try it and there were some really nice really nice moments of the whole thing so no conflict. there was no conflict yeah I I, I, I I wasn't the spec for the worst I was I, I'm always trying to be ready for the worst case <laughs> scenario but I don't know what will happen and I don't try to 
pursue uh, like a specific end. Yeah, yeah, actually we have a barbecue after. They have a lot of fun. They have a lot of fun. They really like it. And they told me that the first five minutes were really diff difficult because they didn't understand what to do. But after that, they, they were ready. And uh, I, I actually have like different things like prepared in case. For example, I have a meta referee that I was an expert in both, uh, um, in both um, sports. So if we have to, if, if things will, we will go wrong, we will have to decide what to do, like to make a different uh, setup of the court or I don't know, like we were expecting maybe something like that happened. But at the end, this was the only, the only accident that we have that is a normal hit with, between the goalkeeper and uh, soccer player and it was the only it was the only accident, but everybody was really, you know, like taking care of him. And <coughs> these videos are so relevant now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I, with this jumping career that I have, I, I sometimes I see this thing and I think things haven't changed that much. So I don't know. I don't know. Should I follow <laughs> doing this? I don't know. But yeah, this is relevant. It was relevant at that time, and it was relevant. So, well, um, at the end, as I told you, since this was not about the uh, conflict, but the other way, let me see, I think here, we have a, almost a last second. Uh, a last second goal. That was the end. It was like really, really exciting. <laughs> the same time for both. Yeah, a lot of points. So at the end, they, everybody got a trophy because it was not about winning or losing. So in the trophy, you have both figures like the soccer and the basketball, and they look like a strange dance <laughs> all together. So you can you see that. that too? Yeah, I made it too. Yeah, it was my sculptural part of the whole <laughs> social sculpture thing. And I was, yeah, you can see me there making photographs as well. And at the end, the both themes of each sport that they lose their games, they asked me for a photograph. So, so at the end, I, I made a photograph of them, <coughs> of the loser players. So, so. <laughs> There were no losers, but they say, yeah, we're more fun. And I said, yeah, we losers, we're always more fun. So I was invited to this show in Spain, and nobody knew me. I think nobody knows me now, but there's a little bit more of my name out there. But anyway, um, I was invited to this show with these huge figures of Latin America. And the curator was an Spanish uh, academic. And he was trying somehow to give uh, the Latin American artists uh, a better view somehow in Europe. But it was very strange because in the show there were people like Tunga or Sildo Meireles or Luis Camitzer, no? that I was really happy to meet them and to show with them. And they were already like international figures and I thought that it was, uh, that when you see a show like that, it might be good if it's uh, an academic review or a more, uh, pedagogical way of seeing things, but when you are talking about contemporary things, I think can be a ghetto way of seeing. So I was making this discussion with the curator, and I told him, well, I will take this um, way of seeing um, identity by nationality that I think is not exactly the right way when you're talking about ideas, and I will make a special work. So the work was uh, an invitation for the people to be at the opening and to um, be in a lecture by Gustavo Artigas. And this is what happened. Hola, buenas noches y gracias por su presencia. Mi nombre es Gustavo Artigas, 
soy un artista visual de la Ciudad de México. Esta charla, intitulada Duplex, hará referencia a ciertos aspectos de repetición e identidad presentes en la producción artística contemporánea. Un ejemplo de esto son las ediciones de los llamados múltiples. La aportación de este género artístico es una búsqueda por lograr un consumo más democrático y de mayor circulación del arte. Estas apreciaciones nos suelen llevar también a repensar la forma en que agrupamos a artistas y obras, qué las hace comunes entre sí, en qué se repiten identidad, originalidad y nacionalidad. Pueden ser solo algunos de los escollos de esta discusión. Pero hay algunas cuestiones dentro de esta repetición de patrones que me han obsesionado a últimas fechas. Un patrón desde el cual podemos evaluar algunas de las problemáticas de identidad y originalidad de la personalidad artística. El fenómeno al cual me refiero es el de la personalidad múltiple. Buenas noches, mi nombre es Gustavo Artigas y quisiera explicarles un poco sobre el desorden de personalidad múltiple. Esta es una condición mental en la que dos o más personalidades parecen habitar dentro de un mismo cuerpo. Algunas variaciones implican la posibilidad de una misma personalidad habitando distintos cuerpos. Algunas personas se ven constantemente envueltas en charlas sobre gente que se ve o comporta exactamente igual a ellos. Varios investigadores, después de aplicar esta prueba, han llegado a la conclusión de que probablemente un 1% de la población general y entre 5 y 20% de pacientes en hospitales psiquiátricos sufren de este desorden. Hola, ¿qué tal? Mi nombre es Gustavo Artigas y quiero participar en esta charla haciendo referencia a este fenómeno desde la perspectiva de la personalidad múltiple inducida por grupos de control mental. En una primera instancia, los especialistas se inclinaron a pensar que este fenómeno ocurría por un constante y extremo abuso sexual durante la niñez. Pero algunos van más lejos al creer por medio de evidencia que la personalidad múltiple es causada de manera deliberada por ciertos grupos. Estos grupos, nombrados como grupos de control mental, utilizan sistemáticamente técnicas de abuso ritual y o satánico en niños. Una lista de los posibles perpetradores de esta corriente incluyen a grupos de autoayuda, alcohólicos anónimos, el método Bob Ross de pintura, órdenes de masonería, grupos de experimentación del gobierno, etc. Hola, permita presentarme, soy Gustavo Artigas. Existen dentro de estos estudios de origen de la personalidad múltiple posturas que entran dentro del espectro de la religión. Esto es, la personalidad múltiple como resultado de la posición satánica. Grupos conservadores críticos creen previamente en la existencia de espíritus malignos o satánicos. Estos tienen la capacidad de poseer a uno o varios individuos. Siendo esta la explicación del fenómeno de la personalidad múltiple, existe la posibilidad que un cuerpo sea poseído por varios espíritus. Rex W. Resenberg psicólogo clínico y recalcitrante, cristiano y especializado en el fenómeno de la personalidad múltiple, enlista 96 experiencias, manifestaciones o actos de ocultismo que pueden ser causa de este desorden. Algunos de estos son ser incapaz de leer la Biblia o jugar a la Ouija, tirarse el I Ching, practicar el Feng Shui, la Sintología, la Dianética o la Santería. Grupos de autoayuda, terapias de grupos y fundaciones de arte. Por medio de estos métodos de agrupación, los demonios tienen la posibilidad de poseer millones de individuos. Para aquellos que no lo sepan, mi nombre es Gustavo Artigas. Quisiera exponerles una cuarta y última posición sobre la personalidad múltiple llamada personalidad múltiple como fenómeno natural. Desde esta posición se apoya un grupo llamado Múltiples Enriquecidos. Este grupo considera el fenómeno como un hecho natural y más como un don que como un posible defecto. En algunos de sus desplegados incluso afirman 
No hay cura para el que es múltiple. Este es un estado del ser, tan natural como ser zurdo. Somos personas, no un grupo de identidades, ni alters, ni fragmentos o partes. No nos avergonzamos de quienes somos, porque somos múltiples y orgullosos. Antes de dar por terminada esta charla, quiero subrayar que estoy, o tal vez debiera decir estamos, muy agradecidos con el comisario por permitirnos este espacio para la reflexión sobre el trabajo artístico. Muchas gracias a todos. So yeah, that was my contribution to this discussion of identity. And still for me, it's a kind of, I, I don't believe in statements, I, I don't like them, but I, I like this one as a statement, like saying, it doesn't matter if it's me, because actually I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. uh, I arrived like one hour later, and nobody believed that I was the real Gustavo Ortiga, so <laughs> it, it, I think, I think the work is exactly about the ideas and not about uh, where you come from or who you are exactly when the thing is really working. That's uh, the beauty of the thing. Yeah, so I have been working with this um, concept of disaster. If you have seen, I will not uh, show more disaster. I have many, many works around that, like the museum on fire or a curator on fire and another show and stuff like that. Yeah, you can see it on the website. Uh, But it was really funny because sometimes when I, I, I was a, well, I am an art teacher as well. So sometimes I started my classes telling the students that to make, it, to make art is really difficult and sometimes risky. And I told them that sometimes as well you can go to things that are really near to you, not far. Like trying to say that sometimes the everyday life is easier to handle and try to Uh, show and to work with. So I told them, if you paint, uh, you have to know the tradition and know that it's something that has been done, done for more than 2,000 years. And actually, it's something really risky. And I start showing these kind of slides to them. Uh, when you can see the, um, um, the damage that the pigments, traditional pigments of painting, can do to your uh, body, So on time, I noticed that actually that was exactly a way that I was looking to art. I have many books about this. And I decided, well, I, I have to paint them. It's, it's not about a, a, a joke. It's about the way I have been working for a long time. And it was just behind me, like in the same tradition that somehow I was trying to uh, avoid or trying to go in a different direction. Somehow I go to that exact point and I start painting. I start painting them and taking the risk of, of painting. So here you can see me painting some white lead uh, that is the most uh, dangerous of the, um, of the pigments, but actually is something really, really beautiful to work with. If you have had the pleasure of painting, when you work with white lead, you understand why people got crazy uh, to work with. And then, of course, because of the, danger to your nervous system. But it's a creamy-like sensation. It's a beautiful material. Um, this is still produced by Winsor and Newton, but you can't find it uh, almost anywhere, but in London and Mexico, for example. So um, when, I'm, when I use it, I, I make this kind of almost performance-like. I feel like Dexter, like this uh, <laughs> TV serial killer mm -hmm. character. I have to unwrap and then re-unwrap all the plastic things and put everything like in special cans and I have to put everything in the trash just to make one of these paintings. And actually it became a really special work for me because usually I was working more with uh, people that I was, you know, making relational video installation. But then painters start um, approaching me and telling me things that they happened to them. So it was a way of bonding with uh, another uh, kind of artist that they make in other uh, kind of disciplines. And it was a beautiful way of 
discussing something that it was really personal, you know, that like the diseases of the workers. No? So I have been uh, following that line uh, for a long time. And you can see here some of these. And I, I don't see them as a way of scaring people, but actually to know that they are making a, a choice. And if they make it right and they take care, nothing of this will happen. So it's a, it's a freedom act at the end. And anyway, you will die of something, right? If you're a taxi, <laughs> if you're a taxi driver, you will have some problems, and if you're in construction, you will have others, and it's just like that, no? <laughs> Somehow, when you decide to work in something, that's the way you will vanish in life. That's the way you will die as well. So it's a death uh, decision as well in the long time, and it's a beautiful thing that you know that that, that can happen, and it's good that you can die doing what you want. And these are the plates for making the, the prints with the, the actual acid uh, in the plate. This is me working in the workshop as it should be, as a good artist. Yeah, I'm taking care of not splash too much. That is a nice way of going back to the roots, you know. From there I started all these uh, processes of going back to color. So it started with this, uh, I want to show you this small... Uh, this is a sculpture and this is made uh, with ceramics and with some lead um, enamel. Uh, that is really toxic too. And there is, uh, it's a resemblance to Richard Serra um, proposition for one ton. And actually there's a text inside and the text is in Latin. And it's about the, the fall of the Roman Empire. So there is this theory that says that because of the plumbing that they have, that the rich people have, and because of the name of the ceramics that they use uh, to it, that's why the Roman Empire uh, perished somehow. I mean, the people that was uh, poor, they were no using plumbing in their houses, so they didn't die because of that. And they were using usually wood or more natural, um, you know, things to eat, whatever. But the, the rich people actually was getting a little bit crazy, so there is some relation between, you know, so these are the, the plates, and it said the story of that, uh, of that theory, somehow. OK, so from there I have jumped to make some poison drawings. This is a, a snake. Uh, it's a small drop of, uh, of poison from a, a snake in some uh, paper. But it looks a little bit like a stained glass somehow. And from there I have jumped to different ways of working with the color. But the things that you have uh, look in the show now, I will jump, yeah, this is beautiful. Look. Well, in, in Rio, actually, is the um, show that I, I started working with this concept that you can see in this show, that instead of just thinking in the pigment, I have been working not only the color theory of the CMYK, that is the way that we, with inks, uh, we reproduce color, but with the RGB, that is the way we construct color by light. Actually, this projection is made through RGB. Each dot of this um, uh, projector is making uh, a different color. And even all the um, um, screens that you have on your cell phones or at your houses or computers have the same. And it's the principle of the color TV. So what I'm doing now, as you have seen in this show, is to bring these two systems together and to try to make something that is about beauty and it's about uh, something that we as visual artists, uh, we know how to handle and we know that we can somehow create like a different uh, way of seeing things and way of, you know, 
maybe uh, is not about uh, at least in the, in the um, stage that I'm in my life is not about pointing something that should be seen but more like showing people things that I'm finding now and trying to make a, a dot or a knot of different um, strings that I have found but a very good knot of loose ends so uh, sometimes they can be around patterns of poison frogs uh, that they work in a very modernist like fashion and they will have these um, uh, experiments of the way uh, the color TV was produced for the first time and then they will let me do things like the one that you can see in the show right now that they go to the principles of, of painting, the principles of sculpture, the problems of weight and actually the problem about beauty because I think that uh, as I told you in this stage I really want to put something on the table that is not only a comment or uh, just a playground but the creation of a kind of experience that it will be again open but it will go to this uh, very specific way of beauty that I think is a really, really, really difficult thing to do. So thank you. Thanks again for being here and for your <laughs> <place>. <laughs>